Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. Um, for anyone who's joined us, my name is Neve Tunnelty. Um, I'm Head of Open Research Services here at the University. I'm delighted to be chairing this next session, which is Further Than Publish or Perish, which I think has been queued up really nicely by some of the conversations we've already had this morning. So the current publishing system is propped up by uh, the current approaches to research assessment. That's come through already this morning. The University of Cambridge has signed the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which was mentioned this morning, which is committing us to not using the venue of publication as a shorthand for quality and finding a more rounded way to approach research assessment. The challenge, though, is how do you go from signing something at institutional level to putting things into practice within the institution? So I'm delighted to be joined by three panellists today. The first is Professor Steve Russell, who is Head of the Department of Genetics and Professor of Genome Biology. He chairs the Open Research Steering Committee and he also chaired the DORA Implementation Group. So who better to talk about this topic, frankly, than Steve? Um, he'll be followed by Liz Simmons, who's the Head of Research Culture, and she's co-investigator for a number of research projects that are looking at research culture. So that, again, Absolutely, exactly the right person for this. And our final panelist is Professor Emma Gilby, um, who is Professor of Early Modern French Literature and Thought. And she has chaired a working group on open research in the humanities. And again, these, this is one of the themes that was coming through in the thinking that they've been doing within that, with that perspective. So um, I'll hand over now to Steve. Thank you, Neve. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, Neve, stop me if I start ranting. As you know, I'm wont to do it, James. <laughs> um, what we're we doing? Yeah. No, so just as a reminder to everyone, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Clearly, eliminating the use of um, completely inappropriate metrics for assessing the quality of a piece of research uh, is paramount to uh, a good research culture and fairly assessing people's uh, research. Um, but it's not just about the journal impact factor, as we've heard in many of the sessions today. Well, I need to publish in these uh, high profile journals and the title of the comic as so much research will bear out, has got no bearing on the quality of individual articles that are published in those uh, comics or journals. Yeah. So we have to get away from using the system that we've been locked into where we value publication venue above all else when trying to assess the quality of an individual researcher when we're looking to hire them, when we're looking to promote them, um, or when we're looking for them to pass probation. These are simply not acceptable ways to judge people's research. Excellence. Now, I wish I could say, having been trying to drive the implementation of DORA uh, across the university, this was universally accepted um, across the university, but I'm sad to say we still have work to do. There are schools and faculties, and I'm not going to name any names here, um, who are very resistant to this view, who are wedded to the fact that their faculty have to publish in particular journals in order to be considered successful. As well as eliminating this uh, proxy for research quality uh, that is the publication venue, we need to recognise that um, researchers and research excellence is much, much wider than simply just publishing a peer-reviewed article or a hundred peer-reviewed articles. There are many aspects of the research ecosystem now which uh, are marks of research excellence, contributors to open science, uh, publication of uh, large data sets. Um, we need much, much uh, to evaluate uh, people's research um, on the basis of a much more holistic view of the outputs they produce rather than just the peer reviewed journals. And the fourth uh, principle of DORA, uh, which we signed up to, but it really is um, um, uh, more a flag to uh, publishers of scientific research is, is that they should use much better uh, 
publishing modalities, uh, the idea that you could only have 20 references associated with a particular paper is something that perpetuates um, uh, these dodgy metrics that we use, like uh, unweighted citations for, se uh, 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 for uh, uh, assessing significance. We don't have all the answers yet about how we can assess an individual's uh, uh, contributions to research, but I, I, I am absolutely certain that metrics are not the answer. So the benefits of uh, uh, signing up and engaging with the overall principles of, of uh, uh, DORA is that we can uh, promote the value of all scholarly outputs, and these are just some of them um, um, that I've listed here, and focus on the merits of an individual's research. Stop this um, futile chasing of publications in specific journals that waste so much time and energy and money. Facilitate much more open science practices. It is very clear to me that, um, uh, um, and I'm sure to others, that the rise in uh, scientific misconduct has gone hand in hand with this um, uh, uh, striving to publish in particular venues. So we need to uh, uh, make our science more open. And that's a key mission, mission of the University of Cambridge is to make all the outputs of our research as open and accessible as possible. And hand in hand with that is improve the rig uh, rigor and reliability of our research outputs. I'm sure we're all uh, uh, aware of the reproducibility crisis. Um, and certainly having much more open uh, 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 and equitable research enhances that and uh, an enhancement of collaboration. So why is a reform of research assessment necessary? Well, this is just one report from the Wellcome Trust. There are many I could have referenced. And, and it's particularly clear that early career researchers are feeling pressurized by a broken system where uh, the incentives from uh, governments, funders, institutions uh, just do not uh, gel with the way that modern research is done. So uh, the bottom line is, you know, uh, intense pressure to publish with too little value placed on, on, on what the science is um, uh, or what the human costs are. And research culture, um, thankfully, partly in light, uh, 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 in light of this report, but uh, many others, um, is becoming a key focus for research funders now. They are saying, well, why should we give you money? Can you demonstrate to us that you are uh, uh, engendering within your institution um, a fair, open and honest research culture? And I'm sure Liz will talk much more about that. And of course, the system's broken. Peer review, we've heard that so peer review is critical. Preprints are, you know, they're not peer reviewed. They're not peer reviewed. You know, peer review is a biased system. Here's just one uh, uh, article um, uh, looking across uh, many different disciplines, neuroscience, astronomy, medicine, physics, physical sciences. Um, amongst members of the National Academy of Sciences in the USA, men had on average 14,000 more lifetime citations than women. That is a clear bias. If you're looking at research assessment based on citations, it's already biased against 50% of the population. Peer review is biased, and we've heard examples of good practice where we have double anonymous peer reviewing, but um, here um, from a study that was done in the Journal of Behavioral and Experimental Finance, where um, a, a paper was sent out uh, for uh, over 3,000 reviews, and the Matthews effect, which I'll go into in a second, was astounding. So the, uh, it was split into three. A thousand people uh, had completely anonymized. 23%, uh, a uh, uh, thousand had um, the, the article where the author was a prominent Nobel Prize winner in the field. And another thousand got uh, 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 the article where the author was an early, a little known early career researcher. 23% instantaneous, uh, 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 only 23% rejected it when it was a pro prominent author, 48% rejected the article when it was anonymous, 65% um, when it was an early career researcher. So this Matthews effect is, and there are many, many other biases. Gender bias distorts peer, rev peer review itself across the field. 
uh, and a study looking at 9,000 uh, editors and 43,000 reviewers from the Frontier series of journals that women are underrepresented in the peer review process and the editors, editors of both journals, uh, uh, both genders operate with a substantial same gender bias. So the system is broken. This golden uh, shining beacon of scientific integrity peer review doesn't really work. It's a broken and biased system. We need to look at reforming it. And I don't intend to go through this, but there are many, many ways of that research assessment and to a certain extent peer review um, are, are, are confounded by a number of biases. And there are many studies, ongoing studies. This is one um, um, from the DORA organization, which is far more than just making a statement, it's actively doing research and looking how to improve research assessment. Uh, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment uh, uh, have, in Europe have produced an agreement on reforming research assessment. We need to take action on this and, and, and you know, Cambridge needs to lead the way here. So what can we do? We should commit to improving our research assessment. Um, by signing DORA, we have committed to that, but um, that is not completely transparent to all of my colleagues across the collegiate university. We have to commit and look at, or at least explore, developing new assessment modalities. Uh, could it be narrative CVs? Liv might talk about this. We certainly have to have far more responsible use of metrics than counting up the number of times a paper is uh, uh, cited. And uh, 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 heavily biased uh, things such as the H index, completely inappropriate for assessing researchers. We have to develop staff training and research assessment. We have to put resource into this in the collegiate university. We have to regularly monitor and review the processes at all levels across the university uh, uh, to make sure that, that, that we're moving forward and having fairer and more transparent research assessment. And we have to have regular engagements across the university to solicit feedback and help disseminate good practice. Thank you, Steve. I was going to follow that. I'm really pleased that I can't see the um, auto cue thing. Um, automatic auto cue really puts you off. Um, but it might cope a little bit better with my standard English accent. Sorry, Steve. Hi, everybody. Um, so, as Neve said, I am head of research culture here at Cambridge, and in my role, I think about um, a very broad range of issues of which um, open research is is one aspect. Um, but one of the things which I'm um, coming to the conclusion of, coming to understand, is that um, how we assess, recognise and reward individuals is really um, underlying an awful lot of the issues that we see that are wrong with the broader research culture. So um, things like, uh, as Steve mentioned, um, poor research integrity, um, that is also very strongly then related to things like bullying and harassment. Um, the uh, focus on metrics leads to a hyper competitive culture. Um, the issue that we have with uh, long hours and poor working conditions. All of this really is underpinned by the fact that people are striving to um, achieve in one particular narrow range of ways. And narrative CVs have been suggested as a potential solution for that. Now, what I'll do now is just talk for a few minutes about narrative CVs, and I'm really interested to see how this discussion goes. First of all, what is a narrative CV? I, I'm guessing that a lot of you have probably come across this already, but just to kind of give you a sense, um, a narrative CV means moving away from the standard format of CV where things are very concise, bullet points, list uh, kind of hard facts, to um, a much more narrative prose based format which allows you ideally to uh, expand upon your contributions to the research environment and provide context to your uh, achievements uh, and your motivations and your um, uh, contributions in general um it's i mean to be honest all cvs are a narrative format but uh, what we're doing here is moving away from um a system where people can just list what they have done 
and all of a sudden we have to write an awful lot more about it. Um, who is currently using narrative CVs? That's a very interesting um, development. So at the moment, it's very, very much driven by funders who are using them in applications for research funding, fellowships and grants. Um, the uh, I'm just trying to think which country was really the first to lead this. The Netherlands have really been leading the way um, on this front uh, for a long while. Um, and I will talk in a minute about because they are also um, slightly shifting their focus at the moment away from the word narrative. Um, and uh, there are a number of other countries across Europe who are also trialing narrative CV formats, um, including the Netherlands, uh, sorry, uh, Luxembourg, uh, Ireland and Switzerland. And then the UK is having a, a really big push for narrative CVs, which is being driven by UKRI and the um, Bayes People and Culture Strategy that was published in 2020. So there was a almost a throwaway line in that uh, document which uh, committed to widespread rollout of the what's called the Resume for Research and Innovation, R4RI. That is the standard format that um, UKRI at least are looking at adopting in this country. Uh, and what we have with this, um, which is really difficult, is that um, there's been a huge commitment to this format without really thinking through the practicalities of what that actually means for applicants, for reviewers, and for the whole system. Um, so the, um, the resume for research and innovation, the format that we're using in the UK, has four um, key areas that you uh, have to um, write about. Uh, it's contribution to the generation of knowledge, contribution uh, to uh, the development of others, contribution to your wider research field, and then contribution to wider society. Those are the four areas in which they want um, applicants to uh, contextualise their achievements. But as it stands, there is no firm guidance on how to actually do that. And I think this is one of our biggest challenges. At the moment, we have no um, solid advice that we can give to applicants to say how much you should write in a box, what you should write in a box, what you should pick to write about. <coughs> um, we don't know at all how reviewers are assessing the information. So we can't give people advice based on what we know reviewers will look at, which is how traditionally um, we would help people with CVs and, and cover letters because we'd have a sense of how the panels were looking at them. There's an awful lot of unanswered questions. There's an awful lot of um, a lack of this kind of support material to go around um, the introduction of these CVs. And yet they are out there. They are being used. Um, I know from colleagues who are working here at the Career Service, they have questions all the time from people who are applying for funding and who are having to address this format. So there's that challenge. Um, there is the challenge that um, when you're asked to write a block of prose rather than um, to uh, produce a list or something more concrete, um, that nobody really knows whether that favours people who are naturally good at creating a narrative. Um, there's been a lot of questions. So one of the things that um, UKRI will often talk about is how um, they really anticipate that the narrative CV is going to improve diversity. And the idea is that the format allows people to perhaps contextualise a more, they call them squiggly careers. So uh, careers where people have taken a slightly different um, route or maybe they've had a break or and, and it gives them space to kind of contextualise that. Um, but uh, lots of questions have been raised about whether or not uh, the format favours people who are naturally inclined toward gregariousness, whether that might favour um, a particular gender, whether that might favour particular cultures. If you're writing in English and that's not your first language, does that produce a problem? Um, so, uh, and also questions around, uh, you know, does this start to favour um, certain disciplines? If you do basic science versus um, applied science, does that make a difference? There's all sorts of unanswered questions around this particular format. And um, so far, the, the analysis of the programmes that have happened have focused very much on, did you like this new format? Yes or no? Um, it's very basic. And on the whole, the conclusions seem to say, yes, we thought it was a reasonable uh, way of allowing us to demonstrate a wider range of impacts. However, took us a lot more time. What do reviewers say? It takes us a massive amount more time to go through the applications. There was a study done on, um, so the Swiss have a, a format they call SciCV, 
it's actually slightly more structured uh, than the R4RI that we're using in the UK, and it also has some metrics in it. Um, but the, that study looked at the way the reviewers were assessing the information given to them, and they all said um, when we couldn't find the information we wanted about the application, the applicants' publications, we just googled them. So I, I think there's a very um, <coughs> strong concern that just by presenting a different range of information to the assessors, it doesn't necessarily change how people will make their decisions. So what we have here is um, something which is being rolled out uh, wholesale across the UK um, by UKRI and a number of other funders with very little support for people who are using it and no real sense of whether this is actually a good thing or not. Um, and I sit on a number of working groups and um, kind of uh, national discussions around this topic. And I'm often slightly alarmed by how often people in um, policy making positions will refer to the narrative CV as a silver bullet. Oh, but the narrative CV. Oh, but the narrative CV. Um, so I think we're in quite a, an interesting situation with this um, format. Um, so the last thing I'm going to mention is the project that I'm working on at the moment in Cambridge. So um, together with uh, my co-investigator, Steve Wooding, and a team of um, researchers and professional staff, we have a, um, a grant from Research England, which is looking at a number of different aspects of research culture, but one of which is testing the narrative CV. And we're actually doing um, thorough testing of a narrative format versus a standard format in live recruitment processes. It's very complicated. We've done an awful lot of thinking about how to do it. We've pretty much got the ethics signed off, which is very exciting. Um, I'm always very happy to talk about what we're actually doing with people, and we will be looking for people to kind of work with us and try this out. But what we're really hoping to do is produce a solid body of evidence that shows what difference these uh, this new format actually makes to the recruitment process, if any. Um, we are at a very... Um, strong risk of, of a project which is funded by a research England, so it's under UKRI, of going back to UKRI and saying, oh, this format of narrative CV that you wanted maybe looks a bit like it doesn't work too well. But, you know, let's see. Let's see where we go. And actually, you know, if we find that it doesn't work um, that well, one of the things we're very keen to do is think more broadly about the recruitment process, because I think the, the aspiration to um, to try and take into account a broader range of contributions at, in the recruitment process is the right thing to do. But we need to think about actually practically how do we get people to do that? And maybe the narrative CV is not the right way or the only way to do that. So that's all I'll say on narrative CVs. Looking forward to the discussion. Right, my thing, if you can just click on the phone button. Right, so, um, yeah, my name's Emma Gilby, and I'm here to give the perspective from the arts and humanities. Um, and thanks to my co speakers for those um, fabulous introductions as well. Um, but it's week seven of term, and so I'm going to do the sort of thing that you do when you're marking an essay and I'm going to start off with the positives and then I'm going to sandwich a few negatives in between and then I'm going to finish with the positives again. Um, so yeah, starting with the positives then, I'm just completely agree with uh, Steve's slight rant, <laughs> let's be honest, earlier. Um, and I think um, most people in the arts and humanities would um, really find themselves aligning with those perspectives. It's been a long-standing um, criticism within the arts and humanities that um, citation indices and so on simply do not work for us at all anyway. That's just the nature of the, the discipline that we're in. Um, you know, we do find ourselves being part of very broad cultural conversations. It's quite rare that we're generating data from scratch. Um, in fact, what tends to happen in arts and humanities research is just that we're building on um, previous people's ideas. And um, if we are working with data in the form of texts or pictures or whatever, we're also dealing with the reception of those. And so actually that question of who is citing whose, um, who, you know, whose, whose data is much less relevant to us. There's also a slower rate of publishing in the arts and humanities, and that's because there's a much more in-depth kind of editorial process as well, I think, um, if you're dealing with that kind of sense of a broad cultural conversation. So it does take, I mean, you might say that sort of 
12 to 24 months is typical actually for an article to come out and so there isn't that sense of urgency responding to um, you know developments very very quickly that you get in the sciences so all of that means that we're very much in favor I would say as a broad discipline um, of um, eliminating the use of journal-based metrics um, yeah in all you know across all the situations that Steve mentioned funding appointments promotions and so on um, and we're also really broadly as a discipline um, working with all sorts of different formats and so that that move towards a diversity of format is very important to us as well um, I mean not least because we have lots and lots of colleagues who aren't even in universities and publishing in that kind of setting so we will often work with colleagues in museums or in libraries or you know whatever galleries country homes that kind of thing I mean you know I've got lots of um, colleagues in modern languages who um, who over the years have done work with the National Trust and so on so um, you know similarly um just just allowing for that and allowing for those different kinds of work to be valued is really really important um yeah on <laughs> along the same sorts of lines we also would have a really kind of diversified understanding of impact i think um and this is a, a word that often comes up in the context of the research excellence framework but there again you know a common complaint of people in the arts and humanities is that impact is thought of in a kind of what we would say is sort of sciencey way um so kind of particularly adapted for um you know discoveries for example you know how many people use your app or how many people use your particular design doesn't doesn't really work so well in the arts and humanities there's also when you uh, when you when you have to sort of demonstrate your impact in a kind of quantitative way um, when the burden of proof is on you to show many to show how many people's lives have been changed by what you've produced in your research um, then that quantitative quantitative model is is rather difficult for the arts and humanities to get to grips with so what you were saying Steve about a much more diverse range of impacts and ways of thinking about impact a kind of more qualitative approach perhaps an em emphasis on the local as well away from that more kind of commercialized model actually all, all of that is very very good um yeah I think for the arts and humanities as a whole um yeah and, and also just that um the way it sort of opens up to teaching as well actually um you know um and we sort of get rid of that sort of hierarchy where textbooks for example are not seen as a very kind of useful or prestigious output you know these, these are some of our most important outputs and that's how people think of their teaching you know they want it to be considered as impactful in that way um so yeah I would say really, really important to think about the, the range of um, research outputs. Um, yeah, sandwiching in with, with a few sort of issues or problems. Um, actually, just looking at my notes here, <laughs> a lot of those um, negatives do, do refer to the problem of research assessment. And we've already had such a fantastic intro introduction to that question of, of um, the assessment of CVs from Liz um, so I won't kind of repeat that stuff um, but yeah it's just this, this question of how we evaluate success um, is very complicated I was going to yeah just mention the issue of time again and sort of research assessment and as kind of Dora pushes us towards um, a diversification it also pushes us towards longer more complex narratives and that can be a very good thing because it allows for the squiggle but on the other hand it all takes time um you know Liz has said that already and when it takes too much time I mean literally more time than anybody can fit into a teaching term then you're back to looking for a shorthand um, and then what kind of shorthand do you end up with um so there's and, and when you when you find a new kind of shorthand then that isn't the standard CV that we're all used to you're sort of back to the problem of bias I think and um so there's there is that question sort of pragmatically of how we provide guidance for evaluation um and again if you're talking about a range of formats just to, to give the sort of digital examples you know if you're wanting to evaluate a blog or if you're wanting to evaluate a twitter feed that is something that's very new we do need guidance on on how to do that <laughs> um actually just um as an aside um i don't think 
you mentioned the, the cover letter, Liz, and this is something that's always occurred to me when I think about narrative CVs is that actually we don't just have the CV, we have the cover letter as well. That always comes in. So it, in a way, the kind of narrative CV thing is just an amalgamation of the traditional cover letter with the traditional CV. Um, so there's a question there about, you know, how, how we think about that as well, I think. Um, so the reason I was going to put this up on the, the screen here is just um, <laughs> because I suppose people in the arts and humanities would often um, think of this whole declaration as a bit too sciencey. Um, it's not obviously designed for people in the arts and humanities. Now it is, we know that, and you know, you've made that very clear, Steve, and I think that's very clear as well. But nonetheless, the fact is that if your standard arts and humanities person clicks on this, um, you've got in the first line, the output of scientific research. Now, I mean, that's not so much of a problem for me. I think people in the arts and humanities are quite used to the idea that science can just mean knowledge. You know, it, it, you know most people I think would just about accept that. But then you get to third line, the Society for Cell Biology, <laughs> second paragraph. I mean, by the time you get to reagents, I mean, literally, <laughs> literally everybody in the arts and humanities has clicked off that page, you know, so <laughs> there would be a case for rewriting this actually, so that it obviously appeals to a much broader constituency. Um, just not necessarily rewriting it even, but just adding to it perhaps. Um, yeah, and then so to, to, to conclude then just with that positive example as well, um, this, this goes back to the ref actually, and I just wanted to sort of narrate a conversation that I'd had with a particular colleague who completely anecdotally mentioned to me that she was cross with her own institution, which I won't name, but it's another university, um, because they were not allowing her to put one of her research outputs into the ref. Um, and the reason they weren't allowing it is that it was um, in the, written in the context of you know, um, a, a festschrift, a kind of celebratory collection for somebody who had retired. And again, sort of in a rather old fashioned way, that's judged to be not a very prestigious research output at all, because it's associated more with you know, celebration and a particular group of colleagues um, you know, wanting to mark the retirement of somebody, but actually the fest shift of the genre has moved on um, from that sense of just marking somebody's retirement. And there have been some, you know, really significant and interesting collections of essays um, that could broadly come under that heading. And this colleague of mine felt in particular that the work that she had done for this first shift was her best work. So she was very annoyed that she wasn't allowed to put it into the ref. And so I said to her, well, you know, they haven't got a leg to stand on because this university has signed Dora, <laughs> you know, so you're able to say then, look, <laughs> you've signed this declaration saying that you support a range of um, research outputs. And yes, in the context of the ref, you're not allowing me to, to put this forward. And she did do that. And they did say, oh, well, you know, it did work out then for the ref. So, so that was a good, a good example, I think, of how Dora can work, particularly in the context of the arts and humanities, because that was somebody who, like me, works on early modern French. So, all right. <laughs> Thank you. So, I believe the microphone should be able to pick all of us up. Can you just check that, um, Dora, with the people online? Can they hear me? <clears throat> Are we audible? Good. Excellent. All right. So, thank you all for the different perspectives. I really loved hearing the two different disciplinary takes. I loved hearing the questioning of the narrative CV and figuring out what happens there and what do we do instead if it ends up proving not to be uh, the solution, the silver bullet that people seem to think it is. So I'm going to throw it open now to any questions from the room. Anyone had that hand up faster than I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Hi, this is, I think, primarily for Steve about, I'm, I'm sorry about this, about metrics, which I as an evil well know, have quite few a few rants about. 
But I've talked to people within the university who say they still feel they're being judged by metrics. So although we've signed up to Dora, how do you address that? And I've had somebody really concerned about it recently. We have a, a statement on the university's website, which is on the responsible use of metrics, and which was approved by the general board of the university, and it's there. I wouldn't say it's that widely publicised, but it makes clear that all metrics are biased and should not solely be used um, um, when judging a piece of research. It is difficult to, to wean people away from this. All I can speak for is um, recruitment that we do in our department, absolutely metrics nowhere near it. In fact, it's, uh, applicants are explicitly told not to include any metrics in their CV. Um, and in the academic career progressions where we, we evaluate for people for promotion, where metrics play no role whatsoever in the School of Biological Sciences or the School of Clinical Medicine. I'm afraid I can't speak for other schools. This was technology. I um, can't speak for other schools. I would say the School of Arts and Humanities are a shining beacon of um, um, Dora goodness and have beautiful policies for their specific skill because I think as Emma points out, you know, the, 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 Dora's a framework and although it's couched in the terms of science, it actually speaks broadly to any research that we do. And that's why it's important that each uh, school or faculty develops a discipline uh, specific set of guidance. And that's what we have aimed to do in the university, um, uh, uh, including, you know, uh, a stern warnings about the inappropriate use of metrics. <laughs> I shall pass okay. that on. Thank you. Um, we have the back corner there and then this will be here on the right. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, since there seems to be quite an emerging market for interdisciplinary research and even new interdisciplinary um, journals as well, which is something um, that me and my team are trying to set up in Cambridge for undergraduates. Um, I was wondering, how does this fit into um, DORA, especially when you say that we need to assess research on its merits, who defines what those merits are, and especially in the area of you know, such different the, the niches between disciplines are so different, especially methodologically, but then how do we assess that? Um, yeah. That's... All assessment uh, at the end of the day is qualitative. It is based on people's judgments, you know, and, and what is very clear is that when one is trying to um, assess uh, interdisciplinarity, then it's a composition of the panel that's doing the assessment that is, is foremost. Again, I, I speak to the, um, uh, the university's academic career progression, the promotion uh, process where uh, there is a, you know, a specific question, is this an interdisciplinary application? And if so, where else do we have to get expertise to be able to provide input into that research excellence? So it's very clear that, that, you know, as a biologist, I cannot um, judge uh, the effectiveness of uh, research in the social sciences, um, uh, particle physics. You know? but, um, so uh, it, it, it's looking at who's doing the assessing that is paramount. Did you want to come on and hold this? Yeah, just to say, I suppose there's more of an emphasis um, within this new kind of framework on the actual output, not in the way that it's presented. So in an ideal world, you'd you'd have those expert assessors just going to the output itself and um, and using um, using their own judgments. Um, then you do back do get back to the question of time, as we were saying, you know. Um, but 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 that's the ideal process I think is that because it is all qualitative you've just got to have the right people going to the the right places if possible mm -hmm. without their judgments being mediated by summaries that can be very inadequate mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's yeah I'm going to in this one for I think um it's been really interesting hearing what you all have to say about uh, metrics which as a small um publisher of, of humanities social science journals I absolutely loathe but still have to try and play the game because authors some authors still can't, can't publish in or aren't allowed to publish in things um, without uh, metrics some of our journals have them some of them don't um, but what I think is a really interesting subject that perhaps all researchers should be thinking about is citation practice that of 
um, individual researchers. So um, don't just cite the same 20 works um, by the old white males, let's say, <laughs> um, which are always cited. Um, look at what's coming out, look, what, look at what's coming up, look at emerging scholars. Um, and actually one of our journals, so I mean, we're a bit of an unusual press in that the I as a publisher have a lot of input on the um, the kind of editorial side of journals. And one of our journals called Environment and History has recently um, launched a, an explicit policy and we have, um, is one of the deputy editor's explicit roles um, to be looking at citation practice of submitted papers and going back to authors and saying, have you looked at the diversity of your reference list? Um, have you considered not citing the tragedy of the commons? Because, hey, everyone knows about that. Um, and so there is stuff that, that we can do from the kind of ground up to to um, protest against this sort of hegemony of um, citation impact and so on. I mean, it's it's probably not good for my journals in in terms of that metric, but I'm hoping for the you know the next wave where you know quality is assessed in a in a different way. But there is stuff that everyone can do in their own work. <laughs> Sorry, I bet you're completely right. <laughs> Well, I can't I can just say, say what, so. what, you, what you're saying that just outlines another kind of unconscious bias, I think. And, um, and you know, just as some of the guidance that we are getting through now in the university on unco unconscious bias is very, very useful. You've got the kind of checklist that you have with every uh, promotions process or every recruitment process. And so you're kind of out lining the need almost for it for a check an unconscious bias checklist when it yeah. comes to citation yeah. as well yeah yeah so i and I, I think just there's a value in just having the discussion isn't there because then what was always unconscious does become slightly more conscious at least so I mean, principle four of DORA is, is specifically targeted at publishers and saying, look, mm -hmm. you've got to look at the way you're doing respective site um, uh, reference lists and things like that should should not be happening. And certainly, I think we heard this morning about the practice of people, um, editors, writing back to authors saying, well, you know, if you could go back and um, cite some of these papers <laughs> from our journal over the past two years, that would be very helpful in getting your manuscript accepted. <laughs> so corrupt practices. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But we're whilst you're within these systems. I would like to refer them not to exist. It certainly couldn't be a community. Ah, yeah, well, other places are less ethical. I think we need to move on to the next question. So, Steve, you talked about um, the various biases which are very problematic in, 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 in peer review. And, and one of the solutions people have um, talk about a lot for this is, 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 is double or blind um, peer review or even triple blind peer review um, as a way of resolving or mitigating some of these problems. Um, and then of, and, and then there's also the, but then uh, on the other side of that, there's the, an issue with how that, whether or not that's compatible with preprinting um, and also the the, 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 the the risk that if we jump to that, if we embrace that at this stage, we, we, we risk sort of locking in journals and current publishers as sort of central to scholarly communication. So I, I wonder what you think about that or what the panel thinks about those that issue. Well, um, uh, these biases are not just present in peer review. I mean, some of those biases are inherent in all research assessments. Um, well, the study I cited actually said, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 rejection rates were, um, you know, about 50% when everything was anonymous. Actually, I think the answer is is to go completely opposite direction, uh, completely open um, uh, peer reviews where, you know, the, the reviewer is named. There are problems with that as well, but I think at the end of the day, uh, it will work out better when everyone knows what everyone's saying. So if you have a sycophantic review of the top man in your field, um, that will be completely open to all your colleagues. Seemingly, uh, in addition, if you have this 
uh, vicious scything review a three type um, uh, response to your paper um, that is just you know, out of order. Um, that will become apparent to everyone who does it. So, in general, um, far more personally, far more uh, looking towards a system that is completely open and transparent for everything we do. It's, it's, it's what science is about. If you have views on something, then you should be able to put your name behind them. I, I realize there's power imbalance things here, but I think that is the direction of travel we should take. But my, my colleagues in research culture and lots of humanities may have different views. I was just going to say, um, yeah, those are the two um, points in tension. And uh, the Research on Research Institute, which I don't know if you've come across, they, they, they did a very interesting report on the future of publishing, um, which looked at a number of aspects of the, the publishing system and what they found was basically everywhere that somebody wanted to make a change there was a kind of an equal number of people who wanted to make the opposite change so half the people are saying um double blind reviewing absolutely let's make it all like you know completely like a medical trial other half are saying exactly what steve's saying which is no absolutely everything has to be totally transparent and there was a number of kind of push and pull aspects in as I say, it's worth it if you look on their website they have a a whole section on that it's quite interesting but what they're trying to do is and i think this is something which is very important in all of these discussions is actually design research projects to test these ideas to actually see what works best um and so this this whole concept of meta research um is becoming more and more um important particularly in the in the field of research culture and i think it's you know so many of these things we have people saying no we want it this way no we want it this way well actually let's look at what the evidence says we should do um, I, I really like the idea of having it all out in the open, um, even having all the editorial changes that have been made to an article out in the open as well. In some ways that could be really illuminating and it would make visible the often invisible work done by editors and managing editors and peer reviewers actually as well, you know, and it would turn research into a more collaborative exercise, which it is, um, and that would all be really positive. Um, and the, the, the sort of meta research question is what does that look like then when you see it and how easy is that to read and um, you know I think that I think I, I would be really interested to see more research into the sort of the article with inline changes and so on mm -hmm. but yeah you've got to have a readable document also mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm imagining that as a teaching tool for PhD students as well, oh, well actually, as you're doing. absolutely <laughs> for everybody to see this is how this article has actually been generated mm -hmm. you know yeah maybe yeah whether you could do it across the board though i don't know mm -hmm. so in the biosciences many people are, are publishing reviews now that are company accepted works and uh, uh discussions amongst uh, the reviewers as to how they reached a consensus on a paper. And that's very positive. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Damien might enlighten us some of that later. Yeah, I actually wanted to go back to the narrative CV. So it seems in some ways it's tackling one side of the problem. Yep. So it assumes that academic roles all have like the same four buckets of requirements. And it also assumes that research is an individual enterprise. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, Marcus Munafu who said that, you know, the nature of research has changed so much that, you know, you kind of need a greater diversity of academic roles um, and also sort of focus more on team science because there's problems that like one person can't solve. So I guess the question is kind of, it, yeah, is there sort of equivalent research into looking at the employer side instead of just the employees? So like, are there sort of is a scope of different frameworks for, so it's not, you're not just trying to use the same CV to respond to this, like any number of roles. It's like, you, it's more like, a, I guess, a normal job description that like you can apply to a specific thing and then demonstrate experience in that way. Yeah, so let me just get the, we've got the right. Um, so yes, the, the, the research, resume for research to innovation does kind of pigeonhole things in a particular way. Um, that it has to be said that the other, there is no standard narrative CV format and the other formats take a, a different approach. Um, and I think you're right that um, it kind of assumes that you're looking for a template. Um, and that, that, I mean, the way that the, the template was arrived at was done in a reasonably robust way. They did an awful lot of 
scoping with the community to kind of get to that point. But a, a framework of what really we're expecting people to be demonstrating is something the sector doesn't have. There's about a million different versions of things flying around that nobody could really agree on. Um, one of the things which is quite interesting, which I think relates slightly to what you're asking, is that there are some um, universities in the Netherlands, and you might have discussed this with the track, I don't know, who are looking at different pathways that recognise that people might take slightly different routes um, in research and developing um, uh, it, it kind of, I mean, it's not uncommon to find a, an, a, a research pathway, a teaching focused pathway, but they're also looking at managerial focused pathways. Um, but I don't know that we're looking, looking at the employer side of things so much um, at the moment with what we're doing. Um, but again, come, I don't, sorry, this is slightly rambly and I don't know if I'm really answering the question, but um, there are also, in my mind, there are lots of different aspects to the recruitment process. And I think, um, I mean, we want to build on the research on research approach that we're doing, and we will be looking at how we can develop the project in the future. And I'm thinking that um, looking at every aspect of the recruitment process from attracting people right through to the interview process, making decisions is what we could look at that in order to try and get a much broader picture of the way people are contributing. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been some work done uh, in other places looking at interviews and that kind of thing. So, you know, we'll hope to maybe expand this. But I think the reason we're focusing on this part at the moment is because the narrative CV is it's almost like it's a growing arms and legs and it's all over the place. And I think we need to say, hang on a minute, let's just check that we know what we're what we're doing here. Does that answer your question? I feel like yeah, I think it was a kind of rambly question as well. It was yeah. <laughs> to do with them. Um, you know there's maybe data manager pathways there's maybe exactly project manager pathways and it didn't seem like the narrative cv format alone would kind of necessarily surface that mm -hmm. so one of the things that um I'm, I'm going to a workshop in the netherlands about cvs we're going to spend a whole week uh working about working on I mean, it's a fascinating workshop we're starting with the history of the cv <laughs> there is there is a session which includes performance art Oh, some kind of performance in CVs. I have no idea what that is going to entail. <laughs> We're good doing some massive data mining thing with ORCID IDs and stuff. So it's a huge. Um, but one of the things that uh, we've we've got to do is is do our own narrative CV, and that's really interesting because a number of us there are are professional staff, not academic staff. And I'm thinking, God, well, I don't think I've got anything I can write in any of those boxes. Well, maybe develop with others, but so I think it is interesting. It doesn't suit. Um, all the pathways in the university and you know I think one of the things we have to do for research culture is diversify and think carefully about the pathways that we do have on offer and I, I'm not sure that changing the CV will change the pathways because we need to look at that separately but mm -hmm. it's definitely something I'm interested in. So really I'm going to chip in on this yeah. one because um, it's really interesting that that's happening at the same time as UKRI is also putting out <laughs> technician commitment and insisting mm -hmm. on recognizing all the roles that contribute to the research process, but yet then moving to an RCC form that doesn't facilitate that. That's a really interesting thought. There's a uh, CV here. Thanks. Um, it's a question mainly for Liz. Uh, I'm uh, from eLife. Uh, I'm talking later about uh, the work that we're doing to try to uh, change uh, the assessment, as, uh, as Steve pointed out. Um, the resistance we've had when we announced this new model uh, is fairly well correlated with uh, the, the level of resistance correlates quite well with the seniority of the researcher as you would you know as you would expect probably people in senior positions have made it you know have been successful in a system that is very dependent on journals and, and journal titles and so on to, to evaluate people but that presumably you know even within Cambridge actually which is you know doing far better than than most in terms of uh, you know uh, encouraging better behaviors there is still you know, has a hierarchy where the senior people are the ones who are more resistant to those things. So how do you, in, in terms of trying to change research culture, how are you addressing that? Are you sort of seeing similar resistance at the higher levels? And, and what do you um, know about that? It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a sweeping generalisation. It's, it's probably got some truth to it um, because uh, the researchers who are making their way into the first um, independent positions at the moment have... Um, been raised, that's a slightly patronising way of putting it, but they have been PhD students and postdocs 
in a time when we have been discussing um, not research culture necessarily specific, in a specific way, but you know, there's been a lot of discussion around research careers and how we develop those people and how we support them for quite a long time. Um, but uh, we do find there are still some um, there are still some people who exhibit negative behaviour even at the early career stage because they're under so much pressure. And I think um, sometimes actually the people at the senior levels of their career have a little bit more flexibility to do things in a in a more generous way because they've established themselves. They they don't need necessarily to have their names on things, the titles on things. People at the, there's kind of like a squeezed stage. People who've just made it to that like first independent position, whether that's a, a career development fellowship or a, um, an early lectureship, um, where they're they're still not very well known, and now and so they're still trying to keep their output up make sure that they uh, are improving their reputation and all of a sudden, and I, you know, I'm sl speaking slightly from a, a science perspective here, but all of a sudden they might also be employing postdocs, employing PhD students, starting to run a group, building up a, um, equipment, all sorts of stuff. And actually, you know, for a long time I, I worked um, as a careers advisor, worked with postdocs and people would often say, I thought it would be okay when I got to be a lecturer, but actually it's worse. <laughs> and so I think there are some, we do, struggle a little bit with people at that level as well, not necessarily being on board with the cultural changes. In terms of the narrative CV, the way, because, you know, we thought about this um, right at the beginning of the project when we were conceptualising it, how do we get people on board who are not necessarily supporters of the narrative CV? Well, really what we're trying to do is build an evidence base to say whether this is a good thing. So whether you think it's a good thing or you think it's a bad thing, come on board and help us build an evidence base, right? Because that's something that appeals to anyone who has an academic mindset. So that's the way I'm tackling it there. Um, and yeah, let's see how that goes. I consulted with the university widely when I was introducing Dora. And I think it's fair to say that at the very senior levels of the university, everyone's committed to positive research culture. Dora, yes, it's great. Uh, most early career researchers, I'd say the majority um, um, uh, in STEM and, and in some cases in some of the non-STEM subjects were quite supportive of it. But there's this middle range where views are mixed. Some people are wedded to the current system. And certainly when I consulted across the entire collegiate university, there was no appetite whatsoever for the introduction of narrative CVs. Every school and faculty that was consulted completely rejected the idea two years ago. I've seen very little support among Cambridge academics for a narrative CV anywhere. Um, I. Uh, and interestingly, my colleagues who work in other universities in the UK, um, so lot, there are lots of places where people are thinking of introducing it. I hear in meetings, people say, well, you know, we want to push ahead with this, but HR are being a real pain and they won't support it. And I'm like, well, we're the other way around at the University of Cambridge, because HR are all for this. And I'd say in HR, I'll qualify that. Um, it's the academics who aren't interested. And, you know, people are busy. They're just, that, that's most of the feedback I get it's just this is just too much work we can't we can't cope with yet another thing to think about and another you know thing to read we want to be able to do things quickly make decisions quickly and this is getting in our way so. mm -hmm. the academic process uh, uh, promotion process at the university is it's run on a semi-narrative uh, cv business you know, you're sure you list your outputs and stuff, but every section contains a lengthy narrative. Um, um, so they're all familiar with it. It's how they got promoted into their professors. But no, 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 it's a bad idea. So uh, who can fathom the mind of the Cambridge academic? <laughs> Thank you. And just picking up on some of the points from that question. Um, just speaking to a humanities perspective, um, I think it's great, as you were saying, about the lack of the importance of metrics and citations. But on the other hand, the challenge is that we still seem very bound by this fuzzy and ill-defined idea of prestige when it comes to publishing venues. And as an early career researcher, I very much identify with that sort of push-pull kind of squeeze middle, where it, on one hand, it's very laudable that we are being pushed towards the open access from the funding perspective. And that's great. But to be perfectly blunt, it still seems like people who are getting hired are the ones being published by the, you know, the, the big, um, the, 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 the areas that we all know. So I'm just wondering what concrete and what kind of things are being done to move away and to challenge that sort of culture of prestige and profile in, in the humanities. 
well, you know, like Steve said, whacking up a massive, great public statement in support of Dora on the on the school's website, you know, is, is one of the first things that we can do, but that doesn't in itself shift the culture, as you say, and that's why I think this sort of event is important, actually, because then you can have people like me standing up and, and saying to early career researchers as well that the entire discipline is, in fact, shifting in this direction, even if it doesn't feel like it. Um, and the more we say it, the more we make it happen as well. And um, I, I suppose, well, like, you know, we've all been alluding to really shifts in research culture take time, but at least I think we are moving in the right direction. And the more awareness there is on these appointment panels and so on, the, the more difference we'll be able to make. Um, and I'm constantly saying to my colleagues, you know, we, we we mustn't be too hung up on which particular journals people publish in and so on. We have to recognise the open outputs as well. We, you know, and it's just a case of the more people say it, <laughs> like I say, the takes, more it will become a, a reality. I think it takes time and it's incumbent upon, you know, strong chairing uh, committees who are yeah. considering appointments. It's also all panel members, you know, um, who are involved in the process, challenging. You know, no one <laughs> would accept statements that are you know clearly demonstrate a degree of of uh, you know sexual or racial bias um, in an assessment process now uh, that took time <laughs> you know if you think back you know two decades i, I should have to think uh, so well take time uh, so i sat on our ukri um, responsive mode panel for about 10 years and that covered the introduction of dora and before um, Dora and the UKRI signed up to it, you know, people would say, ah, well, this is great. They've just published a paper in Glamour Journal X, and then they had one last year in Glamour Journal Y. By the time I left, never was a publication mentioned at any committee. And I, I, I was at every single committee for three years because I was, I was part of the chairing team. And it involved people like me, as soon as a journal title came out somebody's mouth on an assessment panel, you go, excuse me. <laughs> it, so it just takes time to change the culture. We will be in this high hiatus period, but, but uh, you know what? I see evidence of, of it being, uh, 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 of people being uh, respectful of the principles of DORA in, in a positive way in terms of hiring, in terms of promotion decisions, and then certainly in, in terms of um, uh, at least the research council that I was involved in working with, but it's a slow process. I'm going to come in very quickly on that one as well. Um, um, two, two ways. One is the committees that I'm involved with, both on the journal side and on the open research side, it's now constant refrain but we've signed Dora we need to be acting like it it's just coming out of everybody that's involved in that process as now so it is beginning to pick up speed a little bit but it is going to take time and on the bit that's going to take time there's a couple of things coming up that I think will help one is we're expecting next month to launch a recruitment for an open research community manager here in Cambridge and that person's role will be to get the research community, anybody involved in the research process, including the professional services staff, technicians, anybody involved in the research process who wants to be part of this to get involved. And that will help the culture change with, across the university, across disciplines. And the other part of what's coming soon <clears throat> is we're having conversations at the moment with Crash and Joanna's here um, about how we can be pushing the conversations, not just locally, but globally, around open research in the humanities, around these kinds of issues and trying to get that change happening because it is, this is the other thing we hear all the time from NCOs, it's all well that Cambridge really was on board and everyone in Cambridge put it, but if my next job is in the States, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. So this is why we have to be hitting both the local and the global with this and every single person needs to be challenging when they hear anything that goes against it. Um, just behind you, that's it. <clears throat> I yeah, just want to say um, that all sounds very positive. I'm somebody in um, arts and humanities, but I, I would say that, I mean, it's all very well saying it'll take time, but it would be nice if there was like, and I'm going to sound a little bit fascist about this, but kind of almost compulsory training across the board in the university on this topic, because in my particular faculty, 
I've only heard Dora mentioned once and very dismissively as if this is a very, you know, this isn't going to be very helpful for early career researchers, you know, somebody who only partly understood it and they're really not in agreement in a faculty board and on with the next item. Um, so we're a self-selecting bunch who are interested in this subject, but there's a hell of a lot of people in university who aren't. And we've only touched very briefly on the role of colleges, which are a culture unto themselves, that certainly in the arts and humanities are very important in early career. Um, and, you know, the university has very little control over them. So I honestly think there should be something more proactive. I mean, it's fantastic what I'm hearing, but I'd love to get at those people who aren't in the room. I agree. And um, um, the Open Research Steering Committee, in conjunction with, with uh, uh, Neve's new post, will we'll look at pushing for resource in that. It's always about resource in the university. You know, it's been difficult enough to drive this. I would say that the School of Arts and Humanities, at least the leadership, sent a very strong DORA statement. And uh, this is how we're uh, public facing and this is what we're going to do. So I'm, I'm surprised that hasn't disseminated fully across the, the school. University's got no remit ecologies. I don't, I, I, as you well know, Eowyn, I'm not, I'm not, uh, not well embedded in the college system. We are just sorry, just for the people online to repeat the question there was um, whether any consultation has happened with the college or any encouragement for the colleges to sign up. I think we'd welcome it though if yeah. anybody wanted to raise it with their colleges. We, we're going to have a college representative on the new research culture steering committee, which is just in the process of being set up. So, but to be honest, it's hard enough to mandate anything that goes throughout the whole university, let alone the colleges on as well. This is something that. And I think it's interesting what you're saying that, you know, compulsory training just doesn't go down very well in the university. I mean, there, there's a ton of compulsory training. How many of us have done our EDI essentials, our unconscious bias, our prevent trait, you know? So I, I think it's a good aspiration. In and my department, everybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you want to sit in a selection panel, if you want to recruit a postdoc and interview them, <laughs> lectureship, promotion, I have to see the documentary evidence that you've completed your unconscious bias. And, we need uh, everybody to be training. a head of department. <laughs> yeah. just, so, so I would love, I would love to see the same. Uh, you know, just on the on the topic of colleges, I, I, I think they're quite they they watch what each other do quite a lot. I suspect if you got one or two of them to start doing this, they would um, a lot of them would follow through and or at least consider it. So I think it's not as, I don't think it's the question of mandating. I think it's a question of approaching certain people and, and kind of getting it done that way. I'm sure you can get Darwin to... to, to well, to, well to, absolutely, yeah, but, you know. Take up the cudgel. <laughs> can I just say at that point, I'm the director of research at a college called Homerton. We have a research committee meeting on Monday. I will bring it up. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> So going back to the journal's prestige question, does anyone know, like, is there any data on whether this is kind of like a correlation or causation thing? So, I mean, if, is there something about what prestigious journals are kind of a proxy for? So it's to do with, you know, people have well-connected um, research networks, they're well-funded, they're well-supported, they're attracted to particular research questions, they're coached to present research in a specific way, um, that, that sort of thing. So let's say that Springer Nature like collapsed tomorrow, seems unlikely, but let's say they did. Um, would we see completely different people being hired next year or would something else step in as kind of a proxy for the same behaviours and the same attributes? Much of it is historical. So I can only uh, uh, speak in the biosciences because that is really uh, um, my only experience of the publishing ecosystem, really. And, and it's historical. Um, so... I think we can view it in the in the biosciences. We can view scientific publishing as um, uh, pre Bob Maxwell <laughs> and post Bob Maxwell. After Bob Maxwell, everything was a disaster. Um, 
uh, before that, there was uh, a few super prestigious journals, Nature and Science, and, um, um, and then a whole bunch of kind of society type journals. And that was essentially it for scientific publishing. And, and, uh, 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 and it was always good to get into one of these broad impact journals. But with the rise of the metrification of uh, uh, citations, and as I said, um, Maxwell's development of this publishing behemoth, um, things have changed. So I think there's a historical thing um, which has driven this. And if it all collapsed tomorrow, I don't think there would um, be another super proxy thing. Sadly, not e-life, Damien. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> Um, I think we have just time for one more question, and I think Kyle will end up It's not really a question, but um, I think I presumed when we signed Dora that there would be, it would work a bit like Athena Swan, where you, you have this oversight and that you have to prove that you're worthy of being given that sort of award. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a bit either naive or not understanding or disappointed that there isn't enough oversight it seems in the university that this is a positive thing we should be taking a positive route um so given that i was responsible for this i suppose i should answer it <laughs> a there is no oversight the label of dora but the actual dora organization uh, just published um uh, earlier this week uh, a, a sort of uh, an expectation of what uh, institutions were going to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the process of, we signed DORA, and then it was a process of implementing it. The implementation, uh, unfortunately, um, occurred during the pandemic, so it, uh, it made a lot of the engagement quite mm -hmm. difficult, but nevertheless, um, um, we got eventually, and we had to generate draft proposals, send them out uh, back to schools and faculties for um, um, for comment, take on board their feedback, then present something to the research policy committee, mm -hmm. and to the general board, and that was all approved. And the, the gist of that overall uh, policy we have in the university is uh, um, the uh, schools and faculties now need to generate specific tailored guidance um, for how DORA will be embedded in the research assessment in their school or faculty. Yeah? Mm -hmm. To date, only half the school uh, schools in the university have complied with that and produced specific policies. Um, and um, the next step beyond that, and part of that is to, 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 to include um, some evaluation of how well it's been implemented. And I'm starting that process in the uh, School of Biological Sciences and School of Clinical Medicine. We used it last year in academic career progressions, and we will evaluate uh, how well we felt it, what, what lessons could be learned, um, uh, and how better we can progress things. So, it, yeah, monitoring and evaluation is something that the Open Research Steering Committee is well aware of. But <laughs> until schools and faculties <laughs> acknowledge that there is a policy and that they have to uh, engage with it, then we've got nothing to evaluate except to write to them and say, well, this is just quite simply not good enough. And what do they say? So what? Yeah, there's no reward for doing it. Well, wow, come on. <laughs> I'm not a reward-based man. There's no punishment for not doing it. <laughs> I think uh, I'd just like to make a, a comment on the, the kind of Athena Swan race quality charter type approaches versus something like Dora or some of the other charters and, and agreements that we're kind of working towards. My sense is in the discussions in, on research culture in the sector, we are moving away from the award type, um, mm -hmm. uh, accreditation type um, approaches like Athena Swan. And there's a lot of discussion about how things, processes like that gamify what we're trying to move away from you know we're trying to stop gamifying things mm -hmm. because it, all Athena Swan is does is it, it creates a huge amount of bureaucracy mm -hmm. um it's you know competition between departments well we've got bronze or we've got silver and frankly there are places with gold awards where they've filled in the plan they've done all the paperwork but I don't think actually if you scratch underneath the mm -hmm. surface it looks that nice a place to work so um I think there is a recognition that um those ways of doing things are not necessarily the way to, to drive real change. Mm. But I agree um, that, you know, if there's no punishment for not doing something, then 
no one's going to do it so we're kind of stuck in an interesting kind of circle and you know how do we really motivate people to do this um and one of the things that is very interesting i'm going to throw this bombshell at, at three o'clock before you all go <laughs> tea, is how we use the next ref to do something positive in terms of research culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom. That is <laughs> this panel i think so thank you again to our panelists. thank you for all the conversation this has been a fantastic session thank you